Oh, it is amazing to be here with you tonight. What an amazing group of men, an amazing story that has been told. Within that, let's go ahead and begin because there's a lot of questions and I kind of want to make sure I can get our audience on a unique journey as we go forward. So with this, I want to start with you, Sean. I'd like to begin with you. Um, you've directed Night at the Museum, executively produced and directed Stranger Things. I'm a fan and directed <laughs> comedies like Free Guy and The Adam Project. This is very, very different than any of those. What got you interested in directing this miniseries? Well, I think on a, on a, thank you, by the way, everyone for coming out tonight. Really happy to share this with you. Um, I think I, I read this book like many of us did when it first came out. And I was a fan. I was a fan before I was even considering it as a filmmaker. And I think what compelled me, I was instantly heartbroken because as soon as I read the book, I found out the rights had already been snatched up and others were trying to turn it into a movie. But fortunately, it proved too ambitious to compress a 500 plus page novel into two hours. And I approached Anthony and I said, I don't want to shrink your story. I want to honor your story. And I think this limited series format is the way to give ourselves the runway. And I was just, I was compelled by the themes of tenaciously holding on to belief in light that we cannot see sometimes. How amazing is that? And, uh, and these characters, this young boy, this young girl, and how they vehemently protect their goodness and their humanity, even in the midst of increasingly inhumane times. How amazing. Well, let's talk about what we were able to see prior to the actual viewing of the screenplay. A lot of the episode as you were navigating finding characters. So as you were looking for, I would say, the two actresses, Nell Sutton and Aria Mia Roberti, both of whom, you know, is playing central protagonist, uh, Marie Laura, what were you looking for in casting the character and how did you find Nell and Aria? Well, I'm at the Library of Congress, so I'm assuming that many of us <laughs> have read the book or are familiar with this amazing book. So I'm Ooh. sure, right? I, we should pause. We should pause and clap for the book. Uh, <laughs> we're, here for the, we're here for the show. We're here for the show. <laughs> I know, but, but you know what? When I read this book, what I was looking for was I decided I wanted to try and cast this heroine authentically. And that meant with someone who was herself low vision or blind to play this character who's blind. And it's a young woman who's not defined by her lack of sight. In fact, she's defined by her intelligence, yes. the force of her will, her fierce uh, goodness. And I found this seven-year-old in a small town in Wales named Nell Sutton. And I found a PhD candidate in <laughs> rhetoric at Penn State, Aria, this is true. And neither of those girls have ever acted before. That's this is the first time wow. they'd ever acted. That's really interesting. But they had, they had the intelligence and they had the luminous quality in real life that I knew would be a starting point for this character of Murray. Well, and how many, tell him how many audition tapes you watched. I think it was about 1,200 auditions got sent in. Wow. Uh, because as you can imagine, if you're setting out to find blind contenders for this role, you're not going to the usual places. That is correct. Because the usual places don't represent people. That is very true. Because these opportunities have historically not presented themselves. So we just put out an open casting call on the internet. Anyone from all over the world could send in an audition. And among that thousand plus iPhone and laptop and <laughs> family film videos, we found Nell and Aria. And I feel like they're miracles. Oh, we just love seeing that. Anthony, let me turn to you. You've touched on it in numerous interviews, but for the benefit of our audience tonight, for who had not heard it, would you please talk about the experience of writing this book? Oh, sure. Yeah, thanks so much. First of all, Dr. Carla Hayden came out here and introduced this. She's like an American icon. She's just so... <laughs> Correct. <laughs> oh. Anytime I can shout out Dr. Hayden, she's just the most incredible person. Uh, yeah, the book took me 10 years to write. 
uh, mostly because I was freaking out. It was, you know, very well, challenging. Okay. Uh, every time I'd have a character turn around, as you can see, Sean had to build, Sean and his whole team had to build these environments. You know, when a, a girl turns around and looks at her dresser in 1937, I would have no idea what was on that dresser until I did some research, thanks to libraries. <laughs> Uh, but I was, uh, so the original germ of the story, which I think you're trying to get me to tell this story, yes. is I was in Princeton for a year and took a train to New York City, pre-email days, uh, or at least pre-large PDF days, and was going to see a cover for my second book called About Grace that uh, the publisher had put together a bunch of covers. I'm on the train as we're speeding into the city, start going underground, we're probably going 60 miles an hour, there's a guy talking on his 2004 cell phone uh, in the seat in front of me uh, about the movie The Matrix. And as we f uh, fly towards Penn Station, his call drops, and he gets, in my opinion, unreasonably angry about it. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember just thinking that what he's doing with this, he's got a little receiver and a little transmitter, two radios inside this little thing, no bigger than a deck of cards. And he's expecting this thing to send invisible light, you know, light we cannot see, through walls at the, at the speed of light, rebounding between radio towers, and he's using this insane magic that's totally new in the history of our species to have a conversation about Keanu Reeves, right? And he's, <laughs> and he's upset about it. And usually titles come quite late to me, but the title came really early to me uh, that day. I wrote in my notebook, All the Light We Cannot See, and immediately, immediately suggested all kinds of metaphorical possibilities as well. But really the germ of the story, Jason, was radio. that tried to conjure up this time when to hear the voice of a stranger or a loved one or a leader in your living room was a miracle and what what people did with that new power both as a tool of control and disinformation and as a tool of education and liberation well, it definitely comes through in the movie when you say that let's kind of navigate the specific characters of uh, Maria and Verna um, why did you choose to intersect their two lives and let's talk about the duality of how that played out yeah, absolutely. Um, well, yeah, we got to get Joe involved, too. Uh, I feel like uh, I, I thought it was this huge risk. It was really fun. We did an event on Monday in New York City with the screenwriter, Stephen Knight, and he talked about how he really saw the structure of the novel and of this, of this vast, complicated flashback system that he's built in the show as these two slightly inclined parallel lines that you feel will intersect and you occasionally you'll see them, you know, maybe you'll see Verna pass outside a window as Mahari's in the bakery. Uh, and there's a real anticipation that builds for, I think, for the reader and for the viewer as you anticipate this intersection, but you know it's also going to be fraught. How in the world, with all this darkness around them, will they be able to preserve any kind of interaction? So I tried to pull that off for 520 pages or something <laughs> until they end up in the same room. But I, I always find it so interesting how if you promise a kind of possibility of an intersection and of a healing of some kind of moment of connection, uh, how anybody in, uh, experiencing a story will stick it out to wait to see that moment come about. Oh, perfect. All right, Joe, let's turn to you for a few moments. You were the associate producer on this project, and you are the blindness and accessibility consultant for Netflix. What does that position entail, and what other productions have you worked on? Yeah, um, so I, I do this. I, I work on different productions. I'm, I've worked on a number of Netflix productions, but I'm not specifically Netflix. So, uh, but <laughs> what I do is I, I work on scripts. I work with the writers and the producers, like Sean and uh, Dan Levine reached out to me uh, early on, and I'd worked with Stephen Knight before on a show called C on Apple TV Plus. And uh, oh, we got some lovers. We have a few lovers in. That's why audience. we only had three seasons because, uh, <laughs> you know. <laughs> just, oh, that's funny. Is that okay to say? <laughs> Maybe that's not right to say. But I, uh, I helped specific to the scripts, but also as we're navigating it and uh, the casting process as we reach out and as Sean mentioned, watching thousands of auditions and I helped cast for C or the last. Uh, well, for two out of the three seasons, uh, working with Jonathan Tropper, an amazing writer and such, uh, who's also worked with Sean, but um, helping to create accessibility on set and in the casting process. So that's you know figuring out what formats individuals need and how they uh, they want their scripts, and then also figuring out their first marks, last marks. But it, it, on set, it's even more than that. It's uh, also I I have a 
a s assistant who has sight uh, named Kara Herlichka, um, who describes every take. So, you know, you watch with audio description, every take on our show is live described to me uh, as for the little details. We define the actions that I want to look for beforehand, and then, uh, and, and then I ask questions, and uh, then we figure out what, what's being caught in frame, and then I might go talk to Sean and uh, bring up something like, um, you know, we don't see how she's doing this. She's using a technique, but are we going to pick it up in the camera later? And Sean would be like, uh, no, we're not. You, do you want to Can talk I give an example? Yeah, you? please. So, for instance, there are scenes you saw where Marie is walking from her radio desk towards the window. And Aria, uh, who is blind, she uses her feet extensively to map space. So she would measure proximity to the end of the room based on where the rug ended. And Joe would say to me, because Kara had described it, she's using her feet, but Aria doesn't know that the camera only sees her from the waist up. So the viewer won't know she's that she's using her feet. So can we also have her use the back of her hand on a window pane. And so Joe is very savvy about how the experience is conveyed on camera, uh, which is not only something that Aria doesn't know because she's not navigating with sight, but she had also never even been on a set. So Joe would catch details like that that help us tell a story to an audience that we want engaged with this hero. So it sounds like you had to do quite a few, I would say, changes as you went along. Yeah, and a, a lot of those changes were based on notes from Joe. Um, the truth is that, again, I don't know kind of all our guests here, but I've, I think most people have not spent a lot of time with someone who is blind. I think that it's I just, would agree. It, it's just, and you don't know what you don't know till you experience connection. Right, which, by the way, is coincidentally a theme of this story. But every day, Joe or Aria would say, you know, I see the script says uh, that Marie uses her cane to walk to the kitchen. And Aria would say, well, I live here, right? And I live here alone. <laughs> well, if I live here alone, it's an intimate space, and there's no one who lives here who might have left an unanticipated object in an unexpected place. I would leave my cane at the door. I know my own house. And so things like that. Makes sense. That, that maybe Anthony didn't know when he wrote the book. Maybe Steve didn't know when he wrote the script. Maybe I didn't know when I committed to directing this. But every day, Joe and Aria and even little Nell taught me how to represent this authentically. Quite amazing. Quite amazing. So, Joe, you recently said something in a New York Times piece where you stated, having a lead character played by a person who is legally blind, this is what we've been working for for a long time. Yeah. Um, I think having a, and it's not just a character, because, you know, there have been characters, but this is a lead in a limited series on Netflix, four episodes, and she's carrying a great show with an amazing cast, it, it's it's groundbreaking, and uh, you know it, it really hasn't been done. And uh, it was exciting to do that with Aria and Nell, uh, two talented young women, uh, working together to make something happen. You know, we all want to see ourselves in television and film. We want to be represented in society, and we want. But we also, you know, <laughs> we, people who are blind deserve to have the jobs too. And uh, if if we can Agreed. cast totally someone. Agreed authentically, we should. And I'm not saying every person who's blind is the right person for every character out there, because, <laughs> you know, that, <laughs> it's just not the truth, you know? So, and there are not a lot of actors who are blind or low vision, and we're just starting to see that break down, and organizations that are in this room helped us cast these roles. The National Federation of Blind, American Council of the Blind, um, <laughs> the uh, American Foundation for the Blind, uh, and the American Printing House uh, for the Blind, all these organizations helped us with the casting, but also as I did the research and, and as we built this show and we, we got feedback from a number of these organizations on the scripts as well. All right, so Sean, let's 
talk about something that you said and mentioned earlier. So this is your first time working with blind or low vision actors. Can you talk about what you learned from that experience and how you might plan to bring that with you in future projects? Well, I think, as I, I alluded to some of it, but I, I think that we, we don't, as a culture, realize how our understanding of the experience of blindness, and I'm sure this applies to many different experiences, what we think is the real thing is based on decades of tropes and cliches in how it's represented. And, like, and look, the truth is, I was as ignorant as the next person. I when I first sat down with Aria, when I first met her, when I first met Joe, I, I, I re, I'm, I'm mortified to admit some of the presumptions. Ooh. I mean, should, do I, I'm just gonna shame myself, guys. Shame because, yourself. Because Feel I, free. But Feel free. Like, You're only at the Library of Congress. I was in an Congress. elevator with Aria. I know, I'm only at the Library of Congress. It's not like somewhere fancy. Um, just a little library. And I was like, so just Aria, just library. since we're getting to know each other, do you wanna feel my face? And, oh. and she was like, no, Sean, that's not a thing. That's I, I not also, a thing. That's a thing you've seen in movies and shows that represent this badly. I, oh. I love the fact one of the other producers said when Sean told me this, he goes, Sean, it was in the, it was in the orientation packet Joe made for us. Yes. <laughs> so now you can see what a thorough reader I am. Um, but th as I said, I knew that I would need to teach Aria and Nell how to act, mm -hmm. but I didn't know how much they would teach me. And this was really, the nature of making this show was a mutual education and um, collaboration. Oh, how amazing. Let's take a little, let me just add also, Sean is yeah. going to Netflix and asking them to do this, which is brave. It yes. takes courage to say, hey. Oh, interesting. You know, it's much easier to put a really famous face up there and say, here's a beautiful person you all recognize. You might watch the show. It's very courageous that Sean just even wanted to try it, let alone execute it. And to Netflix's credit, um, they backed this. And they backed it because collectively, we didn't just do it because it was right. It felt right, but it felt better. It felt better by virtue of being authentic. And so I'm grateful for that support. How amazing. So Anthony, based upon what he just said, can you describe what it was like seeing your beautiful words come to life? And what did you feel the very first time you actually saw it? Oh man, gosh. Well first, I got to go to Budapest. So Sean, another amazing thing he does, he just leaves his family for months at a time. <laughs> He's got four daughters and they go to Budapest and to France later. But Budapest, 75 days, is that right? And so I, he, another thing that is so amazing about Sean is that he's able to have visitors around while he works. Like he's just like, hey, come on in guys. Like if I was doing that in my office, I'd be like, please be quiet. I'm <laughs> freaking out that you're in here. I have to go to the bathroom. <laughs> and Sean's just rolls. So I've got my, my son is a senior in high school and we land in Budapest. We're all jet lagged. It's COVID. Everybody's masked up and we get to go. It's like an old brewery in this old house. And I, the first thing I see is the model, this model that they've built that I think it's in the first episode. That you yeah. See they've it. seen it. Yeah. And it's so, I mean, you know, it's so unbelievably emotional when you build this thing with language, which is really inexpensive. First of all, my materials are free. <laughs> Sean's are not. And then you see somebody, the amount of care, you don't know if you could tell, but there is, they're made from old wine crates as if, you know, there's not a lot, there's a shortage in wood so that Marie's father might not have been able to have like really nice wood. So he's building this whole model with these, you know, these little vintages imprinted on the houses. And to stand over that with my son to be able to make it like this family thing when it really is a story about fathers and daughters and Sean's a father. And then to see Nell come out and Mark Ruffalo has this really wonderful paternal f manner towards Nell. You know, she, because of EU rules, she could only work about like 90 minutes a day. Or it something. was something very <laughs> limited. That's yes. interesting. Yeah. That is. Yeah, you have to work efficiently. <laughs> efficiently. Yes, efficiently. And he would walk over. And her father's blind too, and he would walk over to Nell's family and walk her over. You know, this is the Hulk. My son's like, that's the Hulk. That's the Hulk. <laughs> I, you know, would walk over and help her up, and I, I was just so moved by on camera and off camera his warm manner towards Nell, and 
So yeah, those moments, let alone finally seeing the finished product, just getting to be a part of it. You, by the end of the first day, you're just in love with everybody on the whole set. To, to execute this thing through COVID alone is this enormously yeah. huge task that I don't have to ever think about. You know, during COVID, I'm like, still just doing my job. <laughs> <laughs> How amazing. So with that, Sean, let's talk about, this is now your third book that you've adapted to the screen, including This Is Where I Leave You and Arrival. So does your process change, or if so, when you're bringing book to life, how does it versus the original? Well, I think it helps if you're a fan first, and I was in all three of those cases. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna, the analogy I would make, and I'm completely stealing this from my, our screenwriter, Stephen Knight, he worded it so beautifully the other day. He said, the book is a mountain. Tony Doerr's book is a mountain and it will be there forever, long after all of us. We're not trying to replace the mountain. We're doing a painting of the mountain. Oh. And so you need to have appropriate respect for the source material, but you ultimately need to listen to the characters and get to a point of understanding the characters well enough that you can imagine things they might see and do that weren't in the pages of the book. Gotcha. But again, never trying to replace or copy the book, but it's an adaptation, it's called that for a reason. And so just having a certain reverence, but not paralyzingly so. Well, you did a wonderful job. I think a lot of us are pleased. <laughs> All right. So Joe, let's talk about what you did as the, in a way of talking with your fellow artisans from production designers, costumes, hair and makeup. How did that work? Yeah, um, so in all the projects I've worked in, uh, I, I've had the opportunity to work with the different departments, but on this one, it, it's something special, you know, because this is, it, it's still historical fiction, but it's its a real setting. I, I might have worked on a lot of science fiction and superhero type stuff, so if you didn't know that, but so this was like using history and knowledge about the world of blindness and uh, getting to work with the production designer and the props department as they pick out the items that are going to be in the background, uh, like the type of braille writer uh, we, uh, we used. We were looking at the Jada dot, and then we started looking at different options for that, and we explored different types of canes, and what year the cane, white cane started being distributed and used, 1931 by the Lions Club. Thank you, Helen Keller, because 1926, <laughs> she spoke to the Lions, so led to that. Um, but uh, yeah, all those things, those little details, and and what about the tips of the canes too? Oh, so the tips were uh, it, it, back then they were uh, rubber or wood. Uh, now not so much. So uh, <laughs> and the and even yeah. and the length of the canes. Oh, it was much shorter. Yeah. And, uh, awkwardly, and we, we broke a little rules with, uh, with Aria's cane, made it a few inches longer, but I wanted it truthfully to be longer for her, but she's like, no, this is good enough. I'm like, oh. Yeah, but Joe would constantly keep our production honest with historic context because, of course, the tools and resources the available period. to the blind in the 30s and 40s are radically oh, okay. different than what we have to do. they are now, and so Joe's research was essential to this. Well, quite amazing. So, Anthony, one unique question for you. Here you are in the Jefferson Building of the Library of Congress. And so I can't help but ask you, and it's not going to be ebook or print, it's actually going to be, what does it mean for you to be sitting here as an author in the Library of Libraries, and you are a proclaimed lover of libraries to be sitting here having this conversation? Oh, gosh, it's crazy. I mean, we got to tour the library for an hour beforehand. Uh, you, I'm sure you can correct me, but if you take all the shelving and stretch it from D.C., it'll go all the way to Iowa. Is that correct? <laughs> all the materials? Unbelievable. Is that, are you skeptical? I'm, I'm going to say close. There are some off-site locations that we have that would probably add to that. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would say yes to that. Yeah, I'm factoring off-site. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It is a um, monument to stewardship. It is a monument to American 
privileging access. Access is everything that's in the librarian's creed. Libraries, as grand as this and as humble as the smallest rural libraries are the last indoor public space that's heated in the winter and cooled in the summer that you can go in, use the bathroom without having to pay for a latte and access the... <laughs> Dead serious, and you can access the accumulated wisdom of the human species for free. That is the most mm -hmm. vital service available. The fact that you'll know far more than me, but that we still try to service every American with a severe visual disability with some kind of aid for free is an extraordinary thing. It makes me so proud to be an American, this facility. Oh. It definitely is a wonderful thing, wonderful thing. Well, our time is short, and then for all three of you, I want you to really kind of think about this question as we start to navigate into our close. So with that, there are some incredible themes in the book and in the movie and in the work that you've actually done. So what themes from In All the Light That We Cannot See and what life lessons from Marie, Myrna, and of course, your other illuminating characters can we discern and apply to our own time. What are your thoughts? And who'd like to go first? Anthony, all right. Okay, oh sure, do you want me to go first? Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, the light that we can see, the human eye can see, those of us who are lucky to be able to see it, is less than one ten trillionth of the electromagnetic spectrum, right? It's a zero at one end, infinity the other end. There's radio waves, microwaves, ultraviolet rays. There's so many things out there that humans can't see. In biology classes, when I was in high school, we were still getting the animal kingdom as this implication. First, it's like <laughs> patriarchal, but we also got this idea that like humans were the pinnacle of evolution, but we are just one experiment of evolution. There are so many limitations that we have, and I think it's so important to remember that each of us is limited in our view of the world, and that if we can take the time to use imagination and empathy as great storytellers like these two can do to remind us to step outside of our own lives and into the lives of others, that can expand, that can move the walls of our empathy just a little bit wider. And in this time where we're continually being told that everything's polarized, that one person is red and one person is blue, all it takes is to use your imagination to step outside of the confines of your own skull. And I think that's what storytelling can do. And that's why I'm so humbled to get to be a tiny part of storytelling on this scale. How amazing is that? <laughs> Joe, your thoughts. So I was thinking about, uh, I'm gonna go with, uh, kind of Werner uh, a little bit and say really like you can change you know you may you you may uh, grow up in a world or a place where these ideas are one way but it doesn't mean you have to follow that path so uh, not allowing society or our world to force you in one direction uh, making sure you find your light uh, in the world Perfect. Sean? I want to pass. Can I pass? Uh, those were very good answers, but I, I just, I guess I was, I was circling ideas that were very similar to what my collaborator said. The, the truth is that um, my own experience on this was a reminder that uh, you, you really, you can have an idea of what the other is, and that is just a presumption. And if we can, as Tony and Joe said, if we can be open to connection with other human beings, we will be reminded again and again that they are not defined by the uniform on their backs or the side of the border that they live. They are not defined by what they are. That's not the whole story of who they are. And I really, when we made this story, when I read this book, when I shot this show, I knew these were important themes. I never anticipated how critically, urgently timely they would be. And so I, I really hold fast to those now. Well, we thank you three. We thank, thank you. you. We thank you. Thank you we all thank you. for watching. <laughs> 3 a.m., guys. 3 a.m., it drops. <laughs> we don't have to wait too long. 
Well, thanks to each of you for a wonderful, engaging conversation. And with that, everyone again, please thank Netflix for this screening and our panel members for their time tonight. All right. <laughs>